topic today is about the newest rage. I thought that was kind of a clever name for it, but in fact it is a new diagnosis. So I think that may have attracted some of our uh, the interest today. Um, it's called disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And um, when I first heard about this diagnosis uh, and the fact that it uh, is something that involves severe rage behavior in children, it certainly seemed to be something I wanted to know about because I see a lot of kids like that as in my role as a developmental behavioral pediatrician and consultant. But actually, all of you see kids with outbursts all the time, right? What, what percentage of the behavior problems you see would you say include what you might call outbursts or really bad tamp- tantrums? Anybody sort of have a sense of it? Probably over 75%. Yeah, it's it's big, right? It's a big part of what you see. And, of course, we're kind of used to tantrums. In fact, we see tantrums in our offices every day, right? But what we're talking about here is really much more severe than regular tantrums. Um, And it can be a sign of very severe mental health disorders. So that's why I thought it would be worth having this this topic today. Uh, So the name of it is, Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder, and for short, it's called DMDD, which I'll probably use that as we go along because it's easier to say. So we were just talking about the fact that um, for pediatricians and child psychiatrists, seeing a lot, of, seeing rages and hearing about terrible tantrums is, is pretty common, um, but it can also be a very serious problem. And in fact, um, rage behavior or outbursts are the most common reason for psychiatric admission. Now, that doesn't mean the diagnosis, DMDD, is the most common reason for psychiatric admission. I'm just talking about the behavior that gets you into the hospital can be dangerous, dangerous rages. So this, that's why it's important to understand this and kind of sort it out. And what probably goes through your mind and certainly goes through my mind and everybody else's mind is, wow, does this kid have bipolar disorder? That's really terrible rage behavior. And the, the, this new diagnosis really came about because there was an observed huge increase in the diagnosis of bipolar disorder in children between 1994 and 2003. Um, even a 40-fold increase. Now, by the way, does that remind you of anything else that's had a 40-fold increase? ADHD and autism? autism? Yeah, well, autism, probably ADHD has not had a 40-fold increase. It may have increased a little in bit. In the 90s, used to, Yeah, it used to be said that it was maybe 5% of kids, now maybe 10%, but that's really only a, you know, two times increase. But autism has had a huge increase, too, and there's actually a possible connection between bipolar disorder in, in um, members of the family and autism. But I'm not going to talk about that today because it's pretty speculative. But the fact is that what people were seeing in the, in the list of diagnoses that were coming out of practices was a gigantic increase in the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And it's not clear whether that was actually bipolar or something else. So um, the psychiatrists all got together. Oh, and by the way, 48% of those were being prescribed atypical neuroleptics. And so that also came to the attention of, guess who? The insurance companies, right? Because not only are we concerned about these drugs, and we can talk about that some, about how um, how tricky it is to use neuroleptics and what the many side effects are, but they're also really expensive. And so uh, here in Maryland, there's actually a program where if you prescribe a neuroleptic to somebody on medical assistance, you get monitored directly by a psychiatrist who calls you up. <laughs> so um, that's pretty inconvenient, but it tells you how seriously people are taking it. So what happened is that the the DSM committee, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Committee, um, started thinking about this in the creation of the DSM-5, which came out in 2013, just two years ago, three years, I guess now, um, because they saw that this diagnosis of bipolar seemed to be not um, conforming to to the persistent irritability. So in bipolar, there has to be episodic irritability, right? But not in so. But that was not what was being seen in these kids. 
And so they created the new diagnosis called disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. The other thing that made the committee think that this was a good idea was because there seems to be, on the limited follow-up data we have so far, a different outcome for kids who have DMDD than kids who have bipolar disorder. Um, it t tends to track towards anxiety and depression, not bipolar disorder outcomes. So and what are we talking about when we're talking about disruptive mood dysregulation disorder? Well, there are two major pieces to it and then a bunch of exclusions. So the first major piece is that there needs to be persistent irritability most of the time, nearly every day. So every, almost every day, this kid is irritable all day long. And they also have frequent and severe, and let me focus on the severe, temper outbursts that are grossly out of proportion, this is DSM words, to the situation. And these have to happen on average at least three times a week. This whole scenario of persistent irritability and frequent tantrums has to last at least 12 months. And we're only talking about kids between, with an onset between age 6 and 12. And it typically starts before age 10. And after age 18, we don't call it that anymore. Then it starts getting called other terrible things, often things like conduct disorder. So this is a, a rather limited age range for this disorder, um, and it's intended to capture those kids who are being called bipolar. Now, the, the aggression that you see with this can be verbal aggression, sort of swearing and insulting, and physical aggression, and it can be to other people. It can be destruction to, of things, and it can be self-harm as well. All of those things would count in the aggression. Um, these behaviors have to be inconsistent with the child's actual developmental level. So if you have a child who has a developmental disability and they're functionally 50% and they're now, say, seven years old, they're actually not at the developmental age of six. And so it wouldn't count for that child. And, of course, the parent may not know what the child's developmental level is, but it's one of the things that we as clinicians all have to figure out, like, is this out of proportion to this kid's developmental abilities? Um, and then it also has to occur in at least two settings, um, with one setting, must be, it must be objectively severe. Now, that means that just because the parent comes in complaining about it doesn't mean it's really horrible. So what comments, what if, have you guys seen this, uh, kids like this, and what, what kinds of horrible have you heard of in terms of severity? What would you call really severe? Um. This is Patty from New Jersey, and I actually just saw an 11-year-old yesterday who, uh, a, a male, and um, mom's describing temper tantrums at home that um, I think culturally they have not addressed um, because males are very uh, revered in this family. And when he was here yesterday, I witnessed several times of him having these kind of anger outbursts and temper tantrums when he refused to do something. and. He was definitely the dominant in this um, relationship. So, yeah, just yesterday I had this 11-year-old. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, good. So that's a good point to think about as having DMDD in the differential diagnosis. We don't know yet, and, and Patty, we may come back to you in a few minutes and try to sort some more things out about it. Um, do you know if this child is having it in two settings? Well, not yet. The mom was kind of evasive about the questions about school, so we sent her at least with a Vanderbilt to have the teacher fill out to get a start on what's going on. Excellent. And which Vanderbilt did you send them? Do you know? Um, the teacher and the parent, both. The right. Initial? Initial or follow-up? Initial. Initial. Good. Good. Everybody know why Patty gave the initial? What's the difference between the initial Vanderbilt and the follow-up Vanderbilt? The initial has anxiety and depression symptom assessment, and it has oppositionality symptom assessment, and it has conduct symptom assessment. So that's the one that's going to get you the most information. That's really useful to know because we often routinely send out the follow-up if you've been seeing the kid over time, but it doesn't get you some of the information that I'm hoping that Patty will get from uh, that thing from the teacher. So that's really good. So what are some of the things that might be rule-outs for DMDD? Well, 
here's some peculiar stuff I'm going to tell you. It's not diagnosed when the outbursts and irritability are better explained by autism, that's ASD, separation anxiety, or PTSD, and if you can't diagnose it in the case of major depressive disorder, you can't simultaneously diagnose uh, oppositional defiant disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, or bipolar disorder. So I'm going to get to some of that. I have a quick question about more. that. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, this is Jessica Tomasula from Eastern North Carolina. So mm -hmm. I have um, a case of an eight-and-a-half-year-old who really does fit this symptom criteria, but, of course, he's already been diagnosed with oppositional defiance disorder um, and ADHD. Um, so I think that it would be hard to make sure that you have all the information necessary for this um, severe diagnosis category, and I think that's oftentimes where I get patients that are coming to me with ODD as al already been diagnosed, or I initially diagnose them as having oppositional defiance disorder, and then, you know, I'm, this is a relatively new diagnostic condition. That's why we're talking about it. Um, right. But so I guess I'm just um, stating that that's probably something that we may run across quite a lot is that they've already been good. diagnosed with some of these things. Exactly. Now, so you're bringing up a really good point, and that is that, um, first of all, all psychiatric diagnoses are kind of on a spectrum, not just autism, everything else, and they change with time and development, and that's what we especially do in the child health care field because people do, aren't already fixed into their behavior pattern. Um, in fact, some diagnoses really are hardly ever seen before adolescence, like schizophrenia, for example, and bipolar is one of those. It's really not diagnosed in, in younger children. So things can change. So what I'm trying to say is things can change, and just because somebody had a prior diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean that they will not qualify for this diagnosis. Um, the other thing about it I'm going to show you in a couple of slides is that there's huge comorbidity with other problems. So I'm going to get to that in a minute, okay? So we're going to keep both your 11-year-old there and your 8-and-a-half-year-old on hold, thinking about whether this applies to them or not. So the last thing I wanted to mention on this slide is that uh, as for basically every DSM diagnosis, when the symptoms are due to a physiological effect of a substance or another medical or neurological problem, then it doesn't get this diagnosis. So the substance that comes to my mind the most is the craziness that can happen when you're on steroids. So keep that one in mind. And of course, you can be on steroids for a long time. Although if you started acting like this, I think you'd probably find a way to get off get off of them. And other medical or neurological disorders, pain disorders also come to mind because kids with pain can be extremely irritable chronically as well. So let's try to sort out a little bit about what's different between MD, DMDD and bipolar. So we're talking about a prevalence for this condition of 2 to 5% of kids. Now, remember, it's only a limited age range. And it's mostly boys, unlike bipolar, where boys and girls are equal. The prevalence prior to adolescence of bipolar disorder really should be less than 1%, unless this diagnosis is really just wrong, and these really are kids with bipolar disorder, and some of that remains to be seen as life goes forward here. In DMDD, there should not be an episodic nature to the irritability, whereas in bipolar, that is really a major part of the diagnosis. And um, the irritability should be persistently present with uh, no breaks longer than three months during that defining 12-month period of basically um, most days, most of the time, uh, irritability. And Here's the hardest one of all, and that is there's no mania in the MDD lasting as much as more than a day. Uh, but in bipolar, there needs to be either mania or hypomania. So why am I saying that's a problem? Well, actually, it's really kind of hard to tell if a kid has mania, right? Kids are, first of all, can get very, very excited. They can have... Uh, sort of periods like before Christmas or before their birthday, and those are explicitly excluded as counting as mania. So Christmas mania is not a diagnosis. Sorry. 
So what are some of the things that make a diagnosis of mania? Well, kids with mania, how many of you have actually seen a person in mania? Maybe not a kid, but maybe an adult. Claudia. And was it in a kid or an adult? In both. Uh, uh, more than oh. kids, actually teenagers. Teen- teenagers. Teenagers with m- mania, yes. Great. And, of course, that would fit bipolar, right? Because I just said that it starts coming up more after adolescence. Can you describe what mania looks like in that kid? Uh, they uh, they cannot sleep. They go through uh, really uh, many days of non-sleep. They cannot stop talking, but they jump from one talk idea to the next. They just talk and talk and talk. Um, they are impulsive. I, I don't know if that's the best way to describe them, but they they tend to be impulsive. They cannot stay still. They want to do things. Uh, 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 so it's almost like if they cannot control their impulses. They they want to be uh, 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 doing something uh, uh, with their time. Right. right. And what kinds of things are they thinking about doing? Did that come up with your kids? Well, some of them, uh, some of them uh, 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 become very sexually aroused. Um, yes. mm-hmm. uh, that that's one of the things they want. They say that they cannot stop. Some mothers, if they are in some substance abuse like marijuana, they cannot stop um, using uh, some drugs. So some of them use ecstasy, for instance, which I think is somehow a little bit to medicate themselves, but they have the need of always feel this sense of acceptance. So they they use um, they use some drugs to keep um, to keep uh, uh, calm and accepted, and that they fit in place. Uh, they they like to uh, uh, go out uh, uh, late hours of the night. Uh, 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 you know they they cannot stay at home in the same place that's that's what i see with some of the stories and some of the patients i have seen very good very good anybody want to add anything from their own other experience in new jersey again um i've seen kids who get very productive when they're manic like they they do very well they get everything accomplished they're happy they're um you know turning in assignments on time and very motivated they want to do things so it's not always negative i've seen a, some positive behavior in, in mania. That's right. In fact, uh, John F. Kennedy is supposedly had bipolar disorder, and it can give you a lot of energy. Um, in terms of expansiveness, one of the things I've noticed is, well, you know, there are a lot of seven-year-olds who think that they're going to be a professional basketball player and a fireman, but when you get into adolescence and they're telling you, I had this kid came in and told me she was going to be an architect, she was going to be an astronaut, and she was going to be a neurosurgeon and, uh, and was completely sure that she was going to do all of those things at an age where, you know, that should have been sorted out a bit more where she would have seen that can't be all those things at the same time. Although, actually, Ben Carson tried, but it didn't work so far. <laughs> so, so the problem is that even in kids with bipolar disorder, they may only have mania 1% of the year. of the time. So getting this history is really difficult, especially if the parent sort of writes it off in their own mind. The child may not be able to report it to you. If they're currently in mania or hypomania, which is a little less severe than mania, um, it's difficult. And that means that trying to tell the difference between bipolar disorder and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is harder than it sounds because of the mania criteria. So just keep that one in mind. So I want to tell you some really interesting stuff I read about the MDD. Remember, this is a pretty new diagnosis, so we don't have a lot of data on it yet. But in one study, they had a video game where they fixed it. So first they fixed it so that the kids were winning all the time. And then they fixed it so that they couldn't win. And what they found was that compared to the controls, kids with the MDD weren't as happy when they were winning but when they were losing, they couldn't keep it together. They couldn't suppress their negative affect. And their threshold for getting upset 
was much lower than it was in the control group. So they were both poor winners and poor losers. So um, that you can put that sort of thinking about it. Now, one of the things that struck me about this study is that for me, video games have been one of the major forces in kids being referred to me for horrible behavior. Anybody having that experience? Even regular video games. By the way, it looks like Candy Crush is probably one of these games that's sick. So the, the kids are getting enraged by it and sometimes so violent they're breaking the computers, they're breaking furniture. It's really a huge problem. I'm seeing this all in my autism disorder population. Uh, anybody else have any comments about video games themselves as a stimulus for rage? Transitioning from being engaged from a video game to doing something boring like going to dinner. That's, that's the, one of the more common ones. Right. That was Dr. Sterner. But actually just losing in the game, even if you're not being asked to stop, can be really, really upsetting to the kids. Now, the second study, which I thought was interesting, um, has to do with showing the children facial expressions and asking them whether these people were happy, angry, sad, what were they feeling. And what they saw in the faces was more anger than the control group saw in the very same faces. Now, the good news about this study is that they actually did an intervention to try to help the children shift their perceptions away from seeing anger to being open to a different expression being present. And with this training, it actually changed some of their fMRI uh, uh, findings, which is really interesting. So you guys have, who've been on calls with me before probably know that there's a name that goes along with this called hostile bias attribution. And this is something we see in conduct disorder particularly, um, and that is that the children take a relatively neutral uh, stimulus, like somebody bumps you in the cafeteria line, they assume hostility from the other person, and they react as though they had been attacked. And that can also be what we're describing here in this situation. So when you're thinking about trying to change somebody's perception away from seeing anger, that's really the kind of thing that we do in cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Where you say, okay, so your emotion, and this is like dialectical behavioral therapy too, so your emotion brain is saying that this person is attacking you, but let's look at the facts here. Did he really come after you, or did this just be, could this have been an accident? Could he have had some other kind of intent? Trying to get, sort of read their minds a little bit more, which is something that people who are very impulsive also tend not to do as well. They don't take the time to say, hmm, maybe they meant something else uh, when they bumped into me. It, maybe they didn't really mean to throw my lunch tray on the floor and make me go hungry all day, or say that they are putting me down. So so those are some things to think about um, when you're sorting out episodes, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So I mentioned uh, to uh, Jessica there that comorbidity is really high with the MDD. So most kids who are diagnosed with the MDD also qualify as having another psychiatric disorder. In fact, 39% have two others, two, two disorders, and 51% have three or more disorders. So that sure makes you think this is kind of hmm, a sloppy kind of diagnosis, perhaps. And um, because uh, oppositional defiant disorder features are present in 82%, Jessica, 82% of the kids with DMDD would meet criteria for it, except you can't diagnose that or intermittent explosive disorder or bipolar, as I mentioned before. So they have all the features of ODD but more. Okay, so they meet the criteria, but there's more than that. Does that help a little bit? The, yes. the other comorbid conditions, of course, uh, as you can see, 75% have ADHD, 49% have anxiety, and 33% uh, and have depression, although you can't have this and also diagnose major depressive disorder. They could have another kind of depressive disorder. Um, so when you think about those things, uh, this makes it even messier, especially that ADHD diagnosis, um, because, in fact, it, kids with ADHD constitute about 75% of all kids seen by developmental pediatricians and 75% of kids seen by child psychiatrists also. So uh, they, have a lot of, uh, they, they have a lot of behaviors that cause people distress and end up getting into 
the student to evaluations and counseling. So you can have ADHD along with the MDD. Answer that question for you, but you just wouldn't call the ODD diagnosis. So let's talk about those specific ones that the DSM said can't be included. And the first one I want to talk about is autism spectrum disorder because kids with autism spectrum disorder often have outbursts, don't they? And, but they have outbursts usually about different kinds of things. So, for example, in um, autism spectrum disorder, one of the possible symptoms is either over or under reactivity to sensory stimuli. These are kids who just can't stand it when it gets too chaotic. They can't go to movies. They have trouble and they may have an outburst partly as a reaction and partly in order to what? Escape, right? So they can want to escape. They're not able to say that what, what it is that's bothering them. But if you think about the situation, the setting events it's called, um, the sensory stimuli may have been what set them off. Um, also, kids on the autism spectrum disorder tend to have a kind of rigidity to their routine, and they get extremely upset if the routines are disrupted. But you may not know what happened, like what was it that got disrupted. So, for example, I had one kid where the mother bought a new sofa, and the kid came home from school, and there was a new sofa in the living room. And he completely flipped out because he didn't recognize that as being part of his regular uh, setting at home. Of course, kids on the autism spectrum disorder also tend to lack the social communication skills to negotiate situations. So when they're upset, they can't say, I'm upset about this. Can we do it a different way? That's not a conversation that you typically have. And they also are, tend to be concrete. So they don't understand things like jokes, for example, or more abstract things that might be going on. And so they can get upset about them because they basically don't understand what's going on. And, of course, trouble seeing other people's points of view is also inherent in autism. So you can many times when you see a kid with rages, one of the things you should do is think, among your differential diagnosis, gosh, I wonder if this kid is on the spectrum also. So always keep that in mind, especially with the increase in the prevalence of autism these days. You don't comment on that at all, Dr. Sterner? Some of the kids we're all seeing are kids on the spectrum. And it's really something to, that's important to figure out also because they're going to need really different services and really different management for their outbursts than kids who have DMDD. Another one of the things that you noticed on that slide as being le is one of the exclusion criteria is separation anxiety disorder. I thought this was really interesting that that was included because if you think about separation anxiety disorder, what we have here is kids who have extreme difficulty tolerating be away, being away from primary caregivers, disproportionate to their age, and in a way that interferes with their daily functioning. But one ha what happens is that they are worried about the well-being of their caregivers and themselves when separated, and they can see a threat of separation in a place where there may not be a real threat, and that can really set them off. So it's another thing to keep in mind. Now, that these kids would be, if you take a history going backwards and ask about early problems with separation, you will find it. So not the DMDD kids, the separation anxiety kids. So it's just important to be sure to ask about, about that. It may not have occurred to you that that was what it was, particularly if you're talking about a 10-year-old. You may not think about asking about problems with separation, but uh, that's going to help you in your differential diagnosis. And then one of the other things that's mentioned specifically is post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. So the definition of PTSD is that the child experienced or perceives themselves to have experienced a life-threatening event to themselves or people close to them. Now, some of the other features are flashbacks or reenacting of that event, an overall kind of emotional numbing, avoidance of similar experiences. But what I think is relevant here to DMDD is that kids who have post-traumatic stress disorder, kind of like the ones with separation anxiety disorder, may be set off and overreact to situations and you don't know why and their parents don't know why. They don't recognize what the trigger was. Emily, any comments on that one? No, I think, I think the, you know, in those kinds of situations, we just have to remember that not all 
The, the presence of a traumatic event in a youngster's life does not mean that they have PTSD and that all of the, these other disorders that, Barbara, you've been talking about can coexist. So you can have um, PTSD and separation anxiety. You can have PTSD and autism. You can ha you know, so I think, I think it's just important to really be mindful of, as, as Barbara, you've said, the context and the situation in which these disruptive events are happening and being mindful that there could very well be unintentional behavioral re reinforcers to facilitate that disruption rather than it seems to be this out of the blue chronic irritability of DMDD. Great, and I'm gonna actually bring you back to Patty's case just in just a minute because I'm having a feeling that Patty's case is gonna fall in that category. So we'll, we'll, we'll bring, bring that up in a minute. I want to sort of get through some of these other pieces first. So one of my pet peeves, if you know me well, you know that I care a lot about sleep debt um, because sleep debt sets you off as being irritable, and, of course, it can be chronic. And you've got to remember that you can have sleep debt that is not just from inadequate hours in the bed because you can have poor quality sleep as well. So always think about the basics. Are there poor routines for getting the kid into bed? Is there a lack of structure? Are there things like electronics or cell phones in the bed, in the bedroom that are keeping the kid awake? And also think about medical or psychiatric reasons for poor quality sleep, including things like sleep apnea, a medical condition, actually eczema, severe eczema is one of the medical conditions associated with chronic irritability um, and things that cause pain, sickle cell being one, we don't see it as much these days, celiac being another one associated with, with chronic irritability, and, of course, PTSD. And any of those things can cause disrupted sleep, too. So getting a good sleep history um, is really important, also because that's probably the easiest one of the things we talked about to fix, right? Sometimes you can actually fix sleep problems, unlike some of these other things. Um, and so making a big difference to sleep can make a big difference to irritability. <laughs> Any comments or questions about sleep and irritability? Yeah, you probably know it for yourself from your own training, right? Mm -hmm. So so let's just talk about um, what is, what's going on in these kids. So the parents often just see the children as angry or spiteful or disrespectful. But what they may be missing is the fact that these children are also very distressed. And that's true in typical tantrums as well as in anger tantrums. So, uh, Ray, do you want to talk a little bit about the typical tantrum and what you might recognize about distress? Well, uh, what, what I would say is that, and when I talk to parents about uh, tantrums, it's important to know the kind of pathophysiology of a tantrum. And we know a lot about that, it, it, and it's really a, it's like a, like blood pressure, it has a, some rules to it. And so, so uh, it's just one to five minutes here. But when they study it, it's about when the brain is aroused in a tantrum, there's 90 seconds of obligatory upset. And, uh, and, then, and then it goes through a pulling together. And, and it's at that moment, post the 90 seconds, that the kid is very, very fragile, and they look at their parent, and they want to be nurtured, but they also want to avoid their parent, and the parent looks at them the wrong way. They can go back into it. So when you hear about a tantrum, if it lasts more than two minutes, uh, then there's probably, in most cases, the parent is turning it back on. You know, you can, when you talk to them, there's also this window before the tantrum when their rational uh, self is, is can be approached, uh, but but once they're onto it, the, the most common thing to, is is that during those fragile moments, the parent is scolding, is doing something that sends them back into it. So you hear about oh, it's an hour. It it is usually now there are kids who are vulnerable, and that's what Barbara's been talking about today. But I think it's really important for parents to understand that because. Um, uh, they have to just sit sit back and be quiet, 
but but sort of are also uh, available uh, during that time when they're trying to decide whether to go back into it or not. Anyhow. Right. Thanks. Um, so so those typical tantrums can sometimes in younger children can you can actually even suggest that the parent give them a hug or hold them if the parent can stay neutral about it. The older the kid, the less easy that is for parents to do. But c- consoling can be appropriate for older kids as well because the child really regrets it. And they, as Ray said, they're looking for kind of forgiveness and being able to move on. Um, so, Patty, can you tell us a little bit more about that 11-year-old and what seemed to be setting him off and how the parent responded to his outburst? Yeah, so, what? well, what the mom described at home is when he doesn't want to do what he's asked to do or he um, just um, it might just come up like asked to put the video game away and he just gets very angry at home. What we witnessed here was, oh, several incidents of him um, absolutely refusing to have part of the exam done and um, absolutely refusing. You know, he's saying to the mom, I am not getting these shots today. I will not get them. Uh, Nope, I don't want them. End of story. And then he would go into, like, these explosive little bouts, and they would last, like, yeah, about a minute and a half, two minutes. And then she would, during this whole time, she'd be trying to coax him and and gently trying to help him to, you know, understand he has to cooperate. And the more she would do that, the more he would say, nope, I've made up my mind, nope. And then he would go into his little fits. So this happened, I would say, about three, four times that we witnessed. And um, she says this is sort of what happens at home, but she kind of downplayed it. Like, it's yes, he has anger outbursts, but he's just a kid. You know, um, she she's trying hard, I think, to think it's not that big of an issue well actually that's really a good sign for that in a way I mean I know that you're a little concerned that she's she's not setting enough limits with him but actually a doctor's office is one of the worst places for anxiety because you can get shots and things and uh, this child I'm concerned about anxiety from what you're saying because most 11 year olds are able to pull themselves together well enough to consider and have a shot so it's kind of a, a huge stress test that occurs in our office. So keep that mm. one in mind as well. Now, I'm, on the next slide here, I'm talking about a book by Ross Green, uh, who is a psychologist. And the name of the book is The Explosive Child. And I think that the, the book has some, some, a couple of principal points that I've got outlined on the slide here. And the first one is that the, when a child uh, loses it and is explosive, it's due to a gap in skill. So when, when he says a gap in skill, he's using a very broad definition for that. Um, it could be a child with an, a, a receptive language disorder or an expressive language disorder or a social communication language disorder or someone with trouble with emotion regulation, which, by the way, includes ADHD. Um, somebody who is rigid or has... Uh, difficulty doing a task and they're frustrated because they have a deficit. Some child who has an excessive uh, jealousy may be set off easily or a child with a, with, who is hypersensitive. So those would all be considered gaps in skills. And basically the premise of his book is that rather than certainly punishing, certainly that's not what we want to do with this. We don't want to punish these outbursts. We need to figure them out. We need to help parents know how to recognize them before they start, so recognize the sequence and the triggers, to be able to acknowledge the deficits the child has and avoid stressing those areas as much as possible, and then gradually work in little steps towards having both the parent, having the child recognize their own triggers, hopefully put them into words, inhibit their outbursts gradually over time, and all of this with the parent and the child kind of on the same team Instead of the parent sort of threatening the child that if he doesn't get it together, there's going to be some bad outcome, saying, I know you can do this. It's tough. This is a hard thing for you to handle. You're doing better. Look at how well you did last time. <coughs> Things like that where they're on the same team. Now, this is a situation where I often give points for the little steps towards being able to recognize, being able to verbalize, being able to 
calm down just a little bit faster with rewards for those points or in the younger kids' marks on their hands. And that can make a big difference in the self-awareness of the parent towards what's going on as well as in the child. So that's just a, a book you might like to look at. By the way, the examples in the book are almost all horrible adolescent examples, so I do warn parents about that. So given all of this, what can we do? Well, some of the things we know that help with irritability and aggression include behavior modification, family therapy, uh, in severe cases, inpatient treatment may be needed, um, dialectical. So my understanding of dialectical behavior therapy is really the emotion brain and the thinking brain therapy. Have I got that right, Emily? Sure. And that it's a, a process of, of really helping teach people about that. Now, it's hard to do in very young children. They, they're, they're all feelings people. But, um, but it's helpful for the parent to start coaching them in that. And dialectical behavior therapy is also one of the treatments that's used in borderline personality disorder. Um, but so there are people who are trained in this kind of therapy as well. And how about the stress tolerance? Do you want to comment on that, Emily? Yeah, I mean, I think that really is just the idea that you can you can sit with bad feelings, and the world will not and come to an end. Um, very good. And, the ability to just so many of our particularly when we think about teenagers. Distress tolerance is the concept we often use when we're working with people, who, uh, teenagers who cut or otherwise self-harm because they're often doing that to avoid the feelings that they're having. So the whole idea of tolerating uncomfortable feelings is a foundational skill in dialectical behavior therapy. Very nice. And actually it brings to mind mindfulness as a therapy and mindfulness is sort of coming to the fore as being useful in lots of things, including ADHD, and also for the parents of kids with ADHD. Because uh, when in mindfulness, the idea is to just watch how you're feeling and watch what's going on around you without judging it and just watch it pass. And that's particularly useful when it comes to bur outbursts, right? Because, in fact, they do pass. And it may take longer for some more severe ones, but letting it just wash over you, knowing you're going to be okay on the other side, this is also part of uh, what's done in panic disorders, to say we know what it's going to look like. First there's this rush of distress and physiological arousal, and then it passes. Now, that's not to say that medicines can't be helpful, but I want to make sure we cover some caveats here. So for ADHD symptoms, you know that stimulants can decrease aggressiveness and irritability, and alpha agonists such as guanfacine or Clonidine and in their newer forms of Intuniv and Capte can be useful in reducing general irritability. Um, if that doesn't work, usually in the hands of psychiatrists, they would think about things like atypical antipsychotics or possibly anticonvulsants to decrease aggression. And if it's really bad, Risperidol has actually the best evidence. But this is a medicine with major side effects, and so you don't want to go there easily. There are some uh, scales you can use to monitor this. One's called the Affective Reactivity Index or the Outburst Monitoring Scale. Those are some uh, scales you might use if you're working with one of these kids. But again, probably this one's out of your league, and here's why. This warning slide is next, and that is, okay, so kids with DMDD have a likely prognosis of going on to anxiety or depression, and they're irritable, so maybe some SSRIs would help them. And they often have ADHD, like 75% of the time, so maybe some stimulants would help them. But if they actually have bipolar disorder, these two kinds of medicines, these two classes of medication, can lead to something called treatment-induced episodic mania, which is basically activation. Um, this is more common when they're prescribed an SSRI without the presence of a mood stabilizer first, but it can also occur with stimulants and um, it can be pretty bad when it happens. So trying to make sure that you're not missing a bipolar diagnosis is important here. And the way you can sort that out, often the family history is one of the most important parts, although people almost use bipolar as kind of a nickname for people in their family they don't like very much. Uh, so you have to be really getting some details about that and thinking about other risk factors to make sure you have the correct diagnosis. Emily, any comments on that? 
No, I mean, I think the good news is that certainly in prepubertal children, bipolar disorder is rare. Um, and so um, we don't worry about that too, too much unless there's a really massive family history of serious affective illness with bipolar disorder. In teenagers, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, we don't typically worry too much about stimulants doing this. Um, we have lots and lots of kids who run stimulants who don't ever get um, uh, develop manic symptoms, um, but but certainly in SSRI. That said, depression is way more common, and so I would rather let a patient declare that they have bipolar disorder and learn about it um, through that happening with an SSRI. Um, then make a presumptive diagnosis that they have it and never know for sure. Um, because common things are common and, and depression is, with irritability is much more common than bipolar disorder or um, uh, DMDD. Excellent. Thank you. That's very good. So now I'm going to give you the bad news slide. So just as I said, I was, I was hopeful when I first heard about this diagnosis that maybe this was better than having bipolar disorder. But in fact, in studies of adults who would have qualified as having DMDD as children. Now remember, we've only had this diagnosis for three, two and a half years. So we don't really know how it tracks exactly. We're only looking backwards to see if they had symptoms. They actually had worse outcomes both than controls and that then also worse than kids with other psychiatric disorders. And that was in terms of adverse health outcomes, like smoking or sexually transmitted infections, contact with police, low educational attainment, and living in poverty. Um, and it was actually similar. DMDD is also is similar to bipolar in some of the bad things of life disruption, dangerous behavior, suicide risk, and psychiatric hospitalization that are possibilities. So one thing I can say from this is, what is the socioeconomic... Um, status correlations. Like, in other words, is a person who is of low SES at higher risk to start with for these things? Because certainly police contact, low educational attainment, living in poverty, uh, and even smoking are associated with SES as well. And I, I can't answer that question um, at this point. But it's not wonderful to have DMDD, uh, if, even though it is not the same thing as bipolar disorder. So that's what I've got for slides. We've got just a few minutes left for other questions here. I think so. We've got a couple more minutes. This is Peter in Denver. I've had a couple four or five-year-olds that have been thrown out of every preschool for being aggressive and hitting and throwing chairs and home. They have these rages that last 15, 30 minutes. They're just out of control. And um, they were diagnosed with ADHD, and that helps some of their, like, sitting still impulse control. But they were still just angry and aggressive. They're kind of below that age range. I mean, they sound like DMDD, but they're too young. Do you mean comments exactly. on that? So, Yes, I do. So, so for one thing, um, separation can be very difficult for four-year-olds, and they can, they can react from separation with those rages. The other thing is that the range of development in four- to five-year-olds is very, uh, very broad, and uh, they may not be able to negotiate what's going on in their, in their uh, preschool or daycare setting. So looking at what kind of environment it is is really important. Also, of course, the ABCs, like what is the, what's bringing out the behavior, what does the kid actually do, and what kind of consequence. Because if what happens is the kid has a rage and gets to go home, guess what? A four-year-old would like to get to go home from school. So even if it's a negative behavior and they get a negative reaction from their parent, you really have to assess the specific situations and think about what the stresses are for that kid. Um, uh, a whole classroom of 20, 40-year-olds may be a really hard place to spend your day. Uh, and so sometimes these kids do better in a, a, a more gentle setting like a family daycare. If they're failing out of centers, it's something to think about. So there is a broad differential. ADHD is certainly among the things that can do that. But think about the child's overall developmental abilities for handling the situation and the specifics of the situation and trying to figure it out. Great. And I think we're going to, next month, we're going to talk about disruptive preschoolers. So, Peter, please come back. <laughs>